Hi, Jerry. Hi. So I thought we can kind of talk about some stuff you've worked on chronologically. So obviously we'll be starting with The Modern Lovers. Yes. It's, it's a bit of kind of complicated album to ask about the production of because it was recorded in so many different places with different producers. It's not particularly... It's actually not complicated uh, uh, particularly. The... Uh, it was recorded three places. The Song Hospital, which is the one that says Donated by Jerry Harrison, was recorded at Intermedia Studio in Boston. Um, and I believe it was a year earlier. And that was uh, just done with an engineer. There was no... At, at the studio where we were able to go in and record. Um, I think that we had to, after there was some other session, so we didn't get to start till midnight, and we had like midnight to late in the morning or something like that. And it was a very frustrating session because <laughs> I think they spent the bulk of the hours we had trying to get a drum sound. <laughs> we had to hurry through some demos that were, I think it was paid for by Warner Brothers. And the initial person who was interested in the Modern Lovers was a guy named Stuart Love, who brought us to the attention of, uh, of Warner Brothers, and eventually then David Burson and John Cale, as well as the, you know, Mo Austin and Joe Smith and various other people were, became involved. The second recording was done when we we had interest from a lot of record companies, and I convinced Warner Brothers and A and M to share the cost of flying us to California and putting us up, so that we could meet basically the people we'd be working with. I don't know if any other band had ever done this before or really since. But they agreed to do this, and they each organized uh, a recording session. And R Warner Brothers was with uh, John Cale, and he, who was a great hero of ours for, for his work in the in Velvet Underground. And that was at Whitney Studios, which, which is on the Valley. I think it might still be there under a different name. And then we worked at... at uh, a studio that Alan Mason, who worked at at A and M, arranged for, and I think it was called Clover, but I'm not absolutely sure. I know they had this cool thing that if they did a mix, they had like a small antenna, and you could go out to your car and hear it in a, on the radio in your car, so you could kind of check if it was going to translate to 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 FM on your on your radio, which was a pretty cool innovation at the time. So who were some of the other producers on that album? Because I know it wasn't just John Cale. And Alan Mason. Who else does it list? Uh, Kim Fowley. Well, Kim Fowley recorded a different record. So that's a... That, Kim Fowley basically did not tell us he was recording anything that could ever be released. We recorded in a garage with well there's two there's two Kim Fowley sessions and I think typical of Kim Fowley that he tried to milk everything for any, any amount of money he could of course never paying us anything so there's um, a Kim Fowley session that we did when we actually had signed to Warner Brothers that was done partially at uh Gold Star Studios with Stan, the engineer who had worked with, f famous engineer who had worked with Brian Wilson and Phil Spector. So if you ever watch that movie about Brian Wilson, you'll see scenes from Gold Star and you'll meet Stan. And actually the, the uh, assistant on that had been one of the crickets in Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Um, we worked at a couple of other studios with uh, with um, Kim as well. We had we had tried working with John Cale uh, previously to Kim in that period of time, which I I think is 1973 or four. So um, 
but I don't. That's not on. That's not on the sort of first modern lovers record. First modern lovers record, I believe, is only Alan Mason. And that was only the demo tapes that were made in the spring of 1972, plus the one song "Hospital" that was recorded in 1971. There then was another record which we recorded, which was which we that started with John Cale and then ended up sort of uh, with Kim Fowley, which is, as I said, was recorded at Gold Star, which basically most of it was not ever released. But if you hear the song, uh, I think that there was a version of Government Center and a plea for tenderness. There's been some uh, releases from that. Kim Fowley also recorded us in a guy's garage named Dinky Dawson, who had a PA system that John McLaughlin and the Mahavishu Orchestra used to use. It was all Bose speakers. And so it had enough channels in the board that Kim made a live two-track recording there with us playing in this garage, which I think is what he put out on Bomp Records. Um, Then there's uh, a record of the Modern Lovers that Ernie Brooks, the bass player, sort of organized that came out that is largely a live recording from the Long Branch Club in Berkeley um, which is called I, don't, uh, I can't I just suddenly I can't recall the name but the, the but the but the album that almost everybody knows was only three people as far as I know unless so it's possible that the newest versions have added more songs to it, and I'm just unaware of that. I mean, there have been different record companies that have re-released it, perhaps they. Was Alan Mason involved in the kind of arrangement of the songs as well, or was he more just there to supervise the recordings? I don't think we changed the arrangements of much on any of those early recordings, Um, with the exception, perhaps, of um, pop because in Pablo Picasso, John Cale joined us on piano. And I had been, when we would play that live, I played drums. But after one take, I was worn out. So we switched and I picked up the bass and learned David, the bass part that David Robinson had played because Ernie was playing guitar. And if you listen closely to Pablo Picasso, you'll hear the bass line become... Uh, you 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 can sense someone getting very tired hand <laughs> on on it because it was the first uh, maybe only time I ever played the bass part of that song. I think that in some ways that that was certainly among the the most uh, striking recordings on that album. Jonathan's guitar solo is just incredible, and jo- the addition of John's piano part is fantastic as well. Were most of the tracks recorded live as a band, or were there any that were more kind of overdubbed and built up? Um, there were, at least with the Kale tracks, and I'm not, I think probably, is that there were some times that the vocals were, were done more than once, or we, or we recorded them as instrumentals, and then the vocals were added as an overdub. But other than that, they were all recorded live. Did John Kale end up playing on any of the other tracks? I don't believe so. I mean, I don't think you hear an inst- any other instruments on that album. It's been a while since I've actually listened to it as a piece, but I, no, I don't think so. So I guess moving on chronologically to the first Talking Heads album, what was the story of the recording of that? Was it kind of just a typical first kind of low-budget album for a band? Well, the uh, this was just... After I joined the band, we we recorded in the spring of 1977, and I had met them, well, seriously met them in 1976, and we had made the decision that that I was going to join the band. But I basically moved to New York in January of 77, and then we began recording in the spring. So we did rehearsals for those albums. We recorded at a 16-track studio called Sun Dragon, with the producer was a guy named Tony Bunch, Jovi, who actually, I think, is like John Bon Jovi's uncle or something like that. He's also the 
engineer who had who started the power station studio in new york quite a famous recording yeah. studio he built that and he had a co-producer named lance quinn who was a guitar player such a guitar player because tony was a very very um sophisticated about recording frequency and things like that but he knew nothing about arranging music or about playing music and what notes were so the two of them uh worked on this with us and we recorded it and then we went on a tour with the ramones to to uh um britain uh and and in europe in may and june of 1977 and then when we came back there were a few things we finished with tony and then we mixed it at media sound which was uh, ed stasium by the way was the engineer on this record um Tony Bon Jovi was interesting. Like in the middle of making this record, he also did disco Star Wars. <laughs> so we had to stop recording while he was recording that because he was getting paid a lot of money for that. Tony was, um, he had recorded R&B and had worked, done work with Motown. And th so the, there was kind of a concept idea with uh in Talking Heads, that that we thought that having a someone who was an expert had expertise at uh, R and B would be a, a, a good producer for us. We were all um, big fans of, and I think that the sort of hidden influence on Talking early Talking Heads is our love of R and B music, and the sort of revealed itself when we did Take Me to the River on more songs about buildings and food and everyone goes, ah, now I know where they're, what, it, it, you know, because I think when 77 came out, it was sort of like, we kind of don't know where this, this music seems to have no references to it, but I think that that became clearer. So anyway, so Tony recorded that record and he was a very used to just working with studio musicians, so very impatient with, you know, a young band wanting to play things, you know, a, you know, tracking more as we did the songs. There were, I don't, he did not have very many real arrangement changes. We did record a version of, of uh, Psycho Killer that has a cello on it that, I don't know if your listeners know the the artist Arthur Russell, who was a good friend of mine, but he played, he's become sort of an underground classic in the dance world, as well as he has classical music that people in various sort of serious music festivals, um, uh, you know, have a, there's a band that comes around and does that. Are you familiar with Arthur Russell? I'm familiar with the name, but I couldn't think of any of the music. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a great variety to it. But he was an accomplished cello player. So there's a, a version. Of, but after doing the tour with the Ramones, and I'm partially at my insistence, I said, Tony, you know, everyone knows this song at, as this much harder rocker, which is, you know, it's, it's a, become a signature song for us. And the verse, this, we shouldn't do this alternative version. This alternative version can live someplace else but we we need to do the version we do so we record basically i think so we recorded psycho killer after coming back from the tour um and as it was back then we mixed the entire record in two days it's interesting how you as actually as computers became involved in music how mixing slowed down because you could be more precise about it <laughs> and recall things and remember things whereas it's to a degree it was a performance like you'd have the the main engineer or, and the producer sort of in the center but very often members of the band would end up doing oh you know if a reverb kind of came and went or things that were a little less not you know certainly like not the vocal level or the drum level or things like that but the something that needed to be done momentarily and you'd have marks on the marks on the 
faders were. Okay, move it from there to there and then move it back to there. But so anyway, that went down more quickly. And so is there anything else about 77 you'd like to know? I think you've covered that you know, the arrangements weren't changed too much from the live set, and I'm guessing it was done mostly played live then as well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's some overdubs here and there, but yeah. But, um, some places where David added uh, additional guitar that you have to kind of listen really carefully to it <laughs> to understand that it's actually a separate part. So if uh, more songs are building with food, at what point did Brian Eno become involved as a producer? Well, we met him. He heard 77. Well, let me just think about this. How He couldn't have heard 77, but we met him on the tour with the Ramones that I spoke of when we played the Roundhouse in London. And he and we were fans of his and we started talking about first of all we've you know it's like we you know it's like i would say that when i went over to brian's house for the first time it's like you were looking in the library and you're going like oh i've got that book i've read this book oh i've always wanted to read this book and there was just a great sympathy you might say of intellectual curiosity and places that people had decided to put their attention that that we shared um and we said that we'd like to do our next record with him because we and he goes well are you sure you don't want to work with tony i think he did a good job and it was sort of our feeling was it wasn't he wasn't someone that we could feel that we could collaborate with i mean he was he did a good you know tony had 77 worked out and sounds really great but it was not the sort of sense of being able to experiment so we all decided that Brian should do more songs about buildings and food. And then we recorded that down in the Bahamas at Compass Point. And I think we were the first non-Jamaican band to uh, go to Compass Point. It was still built, being built. And um, it was... And Rhett Davies was the engineer who went on to uh, produce Dire Straits and... I, I'm not really sure of his entire catalog, but it was a great team and a great amount of fun. I mean, we, you know, it was it was a, it was a time of the year that was it, that you loved getting out of New York from, <laughs> and, and being in the Bahamas was wonderful. What kind of input did Brian have onto the songs? Well, he had much more than Tony, because Brian. Uh, would often, so we still tracked it largely uh, the way we re rehearsed the songs all together. But he would pick out a part and sometimes create a an effect on the part uh, that, and sometimes he would record this without recording both. He wouldn't, he would record record the sort of summation of the effect he was putting on it with what you played but not not record what you had done the way you had seen it and that was you know if we didn't have if, if he hadn't have been someone that we just had such respect for and had this sense of experimentation that could have been extremely frustrating but we were cool with it uh, it would be something like, you know, you played a part, but he put a delay on it so that it added a sort of reflection uh, in the part or some other kind of sound effect that um, or reverb or something like that. But that was the way it went on the on the 24 track. I think we are up to a 24 track recording by this time. For Fear of Music, the next album, was there, a, I think there was a kind of series of demos done before Brian Eno then came in. And got involved with that one. Yes, we had we had written those songs and we were rehearsing them at we we, we used to rehearse out in Long Island City at Chris and Tina's loft. I lived upstairs from there in another loft. And it was a really I mean it was a it was a time when Long Island City hardly had any uh people living in any of the the factory buildings. We were really was a, we, we found this loft because uh, Tina's brother, who was an architect, had discovered the building and had the first place there. And 
we decided that we liked the way it sounded. Brian came out to some of our rehearsals, and we decided that we uh, actually liked the way it sounded in that room. Because, you know, we'd kind of done things like adjust where, you know, the bass amp is or the drums are or so that we could hear well. And so, and we were, we also believed, particularly in the, in the early days, that we would have a different process for making each record. And that would help create a unique sound and a unique uh, experience on the record that would inform the record in addition to the change in songwriting or what we were playing or new instruments or anything like that. So this one we did as, you might say, the recording of a of our, right where we did our rehearsals. So we recorded it, we rented the record plant uh, mobile recording unit, and we recorded it on two Sundays because that was when the traffic noise was the quietest out there. Um, I'm not sure if it's one week apart or two weeks apart, and... I think it was two weeks apart, so that we worked up the first batch of songs and everyone was happy with what we played. We then went to another studio and there were some overdubs that were done. And uh, the... But it gave gave the album, of course, there was more leakage than normal. But because we played rather tightly together, that was all fine because we didn't have um, gobos and the kind of things that studios had for, in isolation rooms and things like that. We had none of that when we were recording it. And one interesting story, and I mean, I've said, I've told the story before, but we were, when we, when we were finishing up the record and finishing the mixing, we were at Atlantic Studios and the, we were listening down and we had not come up with the, any lyrics or any singing for Ezimbra. And we were listening to it and we were about to leave for New Zealand and Australia for a tour and then going on to Europe. And we put up, I, 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 remember, I recall asking, well, let's just, could we just listen to the unfinished version of Ezimbra? And I think everyone just looked at themselves and said, we have to find a way to finish this. So as it worked out when we, is that David and I flew back from Perth on a 30-hour flight. Chris and Tina went on to Europe because we had a, a break before we had to play Pink Pop in Denmark. And Brian had come up, in the meantime, Brian had come up with the idea of, 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 of the Hugo Ball poem as well as adding... Uh, Robert Fripp to the track, and we so we went into a uh, I think Electric Lady, and recorded the vocals to that, and then mixed it, and then we mastered it. Then David and I flew all night to Denmark to play at Pink Pop. But I, I think you know there's a very it's a very kind of crucial turning point for Talking Heads because I believe that E Zimbra our delight in how that track came out informed us that we would really want to explore that direction with its sort of African influence as the next album we did. Outside of that track, was Brian's input more similar to the last album? He still was pretty... He still would be putting effects on and, you know... You know, I mean, he has a great ear for, you might say, sonic landscapes. And... So he felt free to do do that as he had done. In fact, he may have been even a little bit more um, aggressive on that song. And uh, certainly on the song Drugs, that was a kind of a, a mixture of putting inputs into what's called the lexicon prime time, which had a sample and hold function. And then hitting the trigger and letting the notes fly out but sometimes backwards or um and that's why it feels this sort of uh, that solo seems uh completely 
choppy and and uh, as if you're hearing a, something kind of like a mixture of telephone call, calls that are like all of the circuits are crossing or something like that. That song, Drugs, had been an, called Electricity, and we used to play it live, and it was a little bit different. There, uh, There is a version on some of the extra tracks of Talking Heads out that you can see where the song Drugs came from. Obviously, moving on to Remain in Light, that's quite a different kind of album. Um, was Brian involved from the very start then in kind of getting those songs worked up? Well, it was... I, I would I'd also note one thing about Fear of Music. Fear of Music is the only time that I ever worked on songwriting with David, the, just the two of us. So you'll see that I'm a, a co-writer on four or five of the songs. And uh, that was... A, it was When I joined the band, all the songs for Talking Head 77 had been written, and by more songs about buildings of food, a great deal of the songs came out of either songs that we already had but had not kind of perfected when we did 77 or songs that we worked up in our rehearsals. Um, but Fear of Music, because it was a little bit more like we were really more starting from scratch. And there were, anyway, there were just times. Right. So that was, it was something that I wish that it uh, could have uh, continued a different period, but that was a sort of, the one time that that happened. Um, with Remain in Light, we had decided that there was something magical that had happened when you played a song for the first time. And that it very often, in some ways it got better, but that sometimes you lost an innocence or you lost something about the song. So we decided that we would not rehearse before doing Remain in Light and totally record the album in the studio and create it in the studio. And originally, Brian didn't want, he was busy with something and didn't want to do the record. So we were working with Rhett Davies, and he was really somewhat mystified by the process we were trying to go through. And Brian, I think, got a, somehow um, became aware of what our what our plan was, and then he changed his mind and showed up. And Rhett, Rhett was starting to establish himself as a producer as well, and so he left the project, and we went for through a, 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 maybe a week or something like that, or a, a good deal of time, with Brian attempting to be an engineer, which he was really not, and he was slow at, and the assistant there was not really... Uh, so we ended up, Dave Jordan came, who had worked on, was one of the last engineers to work on my life in the Bush of Ghosts with David and Brian. And he became the engineer on the record. So we recorded in the Bahamas instrumentals where we were thinking that the we would record all these parts and then we would find combinations of them. And there was, on all of the, the old boards at that time, there, it was like you could create like two groups. Let's say group A and group B. And there was a single button to turn one on and one off. And that's really how the record was written, A part A and part B with these very... And most of the tracks were recorded one at a time. And so Chris might go out and do a drum part and then... A guitar part might get added or a bass part, and it was this sort of accumulation of parts. So there was an element of all of us being working as a whole there with instruments and the studio as part of the tools. So this was sort of taking what Brian had done on Fear of Music and more, and more songs about Billies and Food, but making it part of the composition process. And so, whereas also we were suddenly very aware of, like, we were in this, usually very often in the studio, like, no, I want this to be, the, no, let's, we're, we're, so we were all kind of in a mixture of of uh, being writers, recorder, record, you know, uh, compo uh, composers as well as, you know, the players as well as uh, helping to shape the sounds within the, in the recording process.
So there's a, there was sort of an equal, a kind of equality. Obviously, Brian had still had the you know a gigantically more experience of being a producer and being in the studio, but we had learned a lot on the records before that, so that we were far more informed to be to make suggestions or to be involved there. So we worked for three or three weeks, I believe, but it could have been a little, maybe it was three weeks after Brian got there. And uh, interestingly, uh, ACDC was making Back in the Black in the next studio. And I think that we recorded all the tracks that remain in light and they did one vocal and one guitar solo. Right. Uh, Mutt Lang was quite a, a really, we, 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 hung around with him and he was quite precise in what he wanted and it was the first album that brian johnson had sung on and he kept kept getting these compression headaches that would interrupt the recording process and you'd see him sitting outside holding his head he goes there's the same way i don't get these when i sing live but you know something about trying so hard and uh so that ed they also, being from Australia, were terrified of sharks. So they would, they and their wives and girlfriends who were there, would never go in the water. And I, th- I think that this is when we discovered snorkeling. Which, <laughs> so we take breaks, or when we weren't recording, go out and go snorkeling, which was it was great. I mean, I'd never done it before, and it was like this whole magical world opened up. But again, that was a, it was a very magical being at, you know, being away from society and just sort of being there working together. And I think it was an unfortunate thing, but Brian needed to take a break. And when we reconvened, we went back to New York and I spent a great deal of time negotiating with various studios and we ended up at Sigma Sound because I had I had worked producing Nona Hendrix at Sigma Sound down in Philadelphia, which at that time was famous for the Philly sound. So like, you know, Teddy Pendergrast and the OJs and, well, you know, a, a lot of, a, a kind of a very, a, definitely a very uh, defined uh, R&B sound. And, so we went into Sigma Sum, but David had kind of gotten writer's block about writing the lyrics because when we were recording the music, there was no concept about what the songs were about or what they were going to, you know, it was just about sonic landscapes and how the parts interwove with a sort of overriding desire to sort of have African influences uh, in in the parts that we played. And all of us had been listening to various fella in particular, but uh, um, there were a lot of other, other groups. And it was just a general excitement of the discovery of sort of Afrobeat that had begun back around the time of, of uh, Ezimbra and continued in that period in between the records. And... and so when we we picked up at, at Sigma Sound, because there are very few between this A B parts, there is a there are not sort of chord shifts that aid you in like a chorus lifting out of the verse or in they're very much sort of as if they're in a mode that goes for the entire song. But that made it much more difficult for David to come up with melodies and then the lyrics for the melodies that felt song-like enough. And so that, that, uh, that process became, uh, um, well, painful. I don't know if it's the right word, but it was, it was certainly challenging. And it was also meant that one of the ways that David got back into uh, um, being sort of in sync with the music was to add an instrumental parts, which meant that certain things were changing. And uh, Chris and Tina in general didn't have the patience to just sit there all the time. And of course, this this was an album project that took months in the studio rather than the other albums that in the end were a much more contained and normal album process. 
And so there was some frustration that things were being lost. I mean, you can hear some of this on the um, extra tracks on the extended versions of Remain in Light. You'll hear things like Double Groove or Fellas Groove. And you can kind of hear what came out of the Bahamas and how different it is than what ended up on, on Remain in Light. And right around the end of this, we got the offer to play the Heat Wave a festival up in Canada and we had already had the Central Park uh, booked and so we were making enough money at this festival that we decided to try and add to the band uh, enough players to play all the parts that basically we had played and I don't I think sometimes people because they've seen Stop Making Sense or seen things like that thought that the people that played it live actually played it on the record, but they didn't. Really, we played everything on it with... Uh, there's some percussion that is done by a couple of other people, but that's about... that's it. And um, and then, of course, Adrian Blue coming in to play the solo on The Great Curve and a couple of other... a few other things, which was, I think, is one of his finest solos. And he um, he was playing down at the Mud Club, and I went down and saw him and asked him to come up and but so anyway so we just we were going to do this tour and david and i kind of sat down like well we're going to need um another keyboard player we're going to need another guitar player we're going to need background singers we're going to need um actually we're going to need another bass player because there's like interlocked bass parts and i had been doing working with this busta jones and met Dillette McDonald and, and, and uh, Bernie Worrell through Busta. And actually, Busta and I had a group called The Escalators. There's an EP that where I was the only guitar player, which was very challenging for me because I certainly was more comfortable on, on, as not being the only guitar player, but being a second guitarist and keyboards is what I had begun as an instrumentalist on. But... I went out one afternoon and I hired Adrian, Bernie, Busta, and Dolette. And then through Bernie, we found Steve Scales. So within a day, we had this unbelievable band ready to go. And we then were running up on the deadline of finishing the mixing the record with, uh, uh, with rehearsals. So Dave, David and Dave Jordan flew back to Dave Jordan's studio, El Dorado, and mixed a few songs while I stayed with Eno and working with John Patoker, mixed other songs so that we could get the album mixed. Meanwhile, I had started, we had started rehearsals out in Long Island City, not at our loft, but at a place that Pink Floyd owned called Britannia Row with this extended band. And I was teaching everybody the various parts on the record. And a few days into the rehearsals, David shows up and everyone goes like, whoa, who's this? <laughs> and because uh, nobody really knew very much about us. So we played these two shows and uh, the, sh the show, the first one was the Heat Wave Festival, which was we were fortunate enough to play just as the sun was going down. And we started as a four piece and then we said, well, we've changed and this whole band came out and it was really, well, it was shocking and, uh, you know, I guess mind blowing <laughs> quotes around that for the audience because it was so unexpected. And then we did the same show at, at Central Park and then we realized that we just had to keep going with that. And so then that became the, the band that uh, toured behind Remain in Light. And this upcoming tour that I'm intending to do with Adrian Ballou, which has now been canceled because of the cancel, I've been actually shifted, time shifted and delayed by the coronavirus, is an attempt to recreate the feeling of that tour. There's a, a YouTube video of Talking Heads in Rome in 1980 that was filmed by a, an Italian t TV station. And and that's the reference point for the tour, and it, you know, for you know, for the diehard Talking Heads fan, I think it's it's really instructive to see that video, and it has similarities to uh, to uh, 
stop making sense, but you see really also some other, some big distinctions. Among them is that we set up in a long line, sort of like King Sonny Day's band did. And because we had two bass players, there were moments where in a sort of jam, one side of the stage was going off in one direction and one side of the stage was going off in another with only a slight reference to the other parts that were going. So it got kind of abstract at times. I mean, unruly as well. And we went back to one bass player on the, on the, on the next tours and stuff like that. At what point did you start working on your first solo record around that time? I had been doing... It was similar to... It was... I'm not sure exactly when it began. I think it began before Remain in Light that I started writing music on a four-track recorder that I had a, one of those four-track cassette decks at my loft in Lyon City. And after we finished the tour for uh, Remain in Light, we decided to take a little bit longer break. And it was right then that sort of all of us did solo records. David did the Catherine Wheel, which I actually spent quite a bit of time working on. And I recorded um, at a studio blank tape that I had also introduced to David that became where he recorded much of the Catherine Wheel. And I had, you know, met all of these kind of studio musicians and various people from around New York, like Yogi Horton. And uh, so the tracking of that album often, inclu often sometimes included Adrian, but mainly uh, included like Steve Scales and, and, um, and Nona Hendricks be became very involved with it. And then we, we went on, Dave Jordan was the producer because I just worked with him and liked working with him on Remain in Light. So we went out to El Dorado to complete the records and do the vocals, which was a big challenge for me because I had never been a real singer in the band. I did some background vocals, but I, uh, it was a real learning experience to basically also be happy with lyrics that I, or sometimes Nona and I had written and to, and to do the vocal parts. Um, the music had, had come pretty simply, and I sort of... So, so the recording process was akin to what we had done in Remain in Light, the idea of coming up with the interlocking parts and then sort of, sort of molding a song out of what you had recorded as music. But, all of, but most of that had started with me doing it on the four-track recorder, which I then just transferred to the 24 track and then added, I often had a drum machine on it and then added real drums and, you know, a real bass and various things that had been uh, simulated. But there was always something that often, now, now there were a few songs that were such straightforward songs that we could just record as ensemble songs like Slink and things like that. But, uh, and so then we went out to, to uh, California, and we and we I completed the record with Dave Jord and with with great deal of help with Nona Hendricks and Steve Scales came out there and various other um, singers that Nona found through her world of kind of knowing the world of background singers all over the country from her years of experience starting you know because she was in La Belle with. Speaking in tongues, was there kind of an active choice in the band not to have an outside producer? Was it more that you just didn't kind of find anyone right for it? I think we wanted to try doing it ourselves. And um, we had learned from the three records with Eno, and as I said, the Remain in Light process, the separation between the studio and the recording space was sort of obliterated. So we wanted to do it ourselves. Um, and we the writing process, we did it at in our still in a fairly adding parts and but we did it with rehearsals and we and we did it again music first but we also very much realized that the difficulty that david had had in writing lyrics we built in chord changes and we built in changes of sections so that it felt like something with a chorus versus the verse and we recorded the basics at, at the same studio. I was talking about blank tape, which 
did did commercials during the day and did disco records at night. And so the the drums there have this very had this very tight well basically the sound that are on disco records and which we, we quite liked. And Chris actually just used their set but brought his snare drum and cymbals. But it meant that we were, you know, this was at the time period, still the time period where you didn't have lockout. You, you know, some, a different session was during the day and you worked at night. In the Bahamas, we had had the luxury of generally being, being able to leave our equipment set up and the mic set up. And if there was another session, it would be mixing or a simple overdub like vocals or something like that that didn't get in the way. Whereas when you get back to New York, they didn't really work that way. They worked. You had to pay for double sessions if you wanted both day and night, which at that time was, you know, could end up being like $4,000 a day, although we always negotiated about much about half that. And, but in fact, and, and then we ended up going to the Bahamas to finish that record, and we were using the engineer Alex Sadkin. But to be honest, really, Alex was in the, it was the beginning of him becoming a producer. And so he had many ideas that ended up influencing that record. And, you know, he, in many ways, is a co-producer on that record. He uh, was a wonderful guy who had a sort of untimely death down in the Bahamas in an accident where a Jeep rolled over into into a a stone wall. And it was just shocking to everybody. But, you know, anyway, that was a record that was done again sort of extending the process that we had begun in Remain in Light, but learning the lessons from Remain in Light. With Stop Making Sense, I know there were some overdubs done after the kind of live taping. Do you remember what those were and kind of why they were done? Um, they were usually, basically we recorded the the show all three nights that it was filmed. I'm not sure if we recorded it at the rehearsal night. And then we picked the the music performances that we liked the best from the three nights and assembled those. And we, so the editing of the video then had to, you'll notice, I mean, you didn't really notice it when it came out so much, but now when you watch it on, on DVD, which of course, or or Blu-ray or something like that, or streaming, that you have, um, there's sometimes are discontinuities and timing that are built into the digital processors that, you know, sync gets a little bit off, so sometimes you don't know if it's that, but you'll see places where, there's, like in the the vocals, there's, I mean, it was, Lisa Day did a fabulous job of, of editing it and getting sync as well, as best as possible. But anyway, so we picked out those, but there were places where on the vocal mics, there was too much leakage of all the rest of the instruments. And so the, we would read, we redid vocals when there, was, there wasn't the clarity. And I think, that, I think there might have been a couple, there were very, very few instrumental tracks were uh, uh, overdubbed. It would have been, well, I mean, it might have just been that, well, we liked the overall performance, but someone made a really obvious and unfortunate mistake. <laughs> and so it was better to overdub it, that one part. And this was before, you know, computer-based editing systems. So the idea of, like, flying the same performance in and time-adjusting it from one of the other nights was basically impossible. So the the way to fix it was to just re-record it. But it wasn't, you know, it was largely vocals because of leakage. What? Any of the songs done along or kind of started out with a metronome? Because I can see at one point Chris has headphones and counts. Yes, every song started with a metronome that was then... So they always started at the beat each night, but we didn't have a click track to play to, and Chris was not listening to a click track. So there is variance night to night. And again, that is one of the reasons that since you pick one performance that you have 
you know, you have sync issues with video. Was Little Creatures quite similar to speaking in tongues in terms of the process? No, no, it was very different. Little Creatures were really... David started working on true stories, and he wrote this... He was starting writing this sort of Americana songs that for true stories, and the songs on Little Creatures really were the songs that didn't really fit the movie. And so we recorded that as, that was a song that David really had written the songs, and we then came and added in suggestions and parts and created the uh, music that went around those songs. Um, but it was recorded all in a piece. And interestingly, when we were doing the mixing of Little Creatures, and also we brought in E.T. Thorngren, who uh, basically... I was the sort of the band, the pers- only person who was le- basically left in New York when when we were mixing the album for Stop Making Sense. So I had been out in L.A. when we were working on the the edit and the mixing with David, and when we mixed that there, which we ended up actually after one week throwing it out and hiring a different mixer because it wasn't punchy enough. And... That was very laborious because you'd constantly be losing sync between picture and audio and have to stop. It was like you'd get like 10 seconds of of a song mixed and then, you know, you're using sprocketed tape as well as time code. And it was, you know, it was an early days of all of the sync and how, and and very cumbersome how it worked. When we got to the album, then we were, E.T. and I would basically, we were always kind of hunting around for studios that had time. And, but as as we developed a really deep friendship at that time, and Chris was in and out of town and would come in, but David was off, I think, largely in Texas, like, you know, scouting locations for true stories and working on that. Um, so anyway, E.T., we were, we actually had had, while we were on tour, uh, Chris Kimsey, who had done a an album that we really liked, a live album of the Rolling Stones, did a mix of, of For Stop Making Sense that we ended up not really liking and, and throwing out, which really, I don't know whatever happened to that. Um, I know that was very frustrating for him, but of course he had no guidance from us when we were doing it, so a little unfair. Um so, anyway, I do think that Stop Making Sense, just interestingly, is the first live album that has the immediacy of a studio album. And some of that had to do with uh, technology that had been invented. We did record that record digitally because we knew that in the process of making a film, you ended up having to make multiple copies. So it was, it was uh, recorded on two locked Sony 24 track digital tape machines. Of course, this is back when digital tape machines kind of had a harsh high end, which we had to sort of accommodate when mixing. Uh, it had to do with the way the converters were and the sampling rate. And I mean, I think all of us have experienced the way early CDs sounded, where the, the frequency the the frequency range and the frequency uh, sounds very different than an LP because they very often just took the cassette master where you sometimes would put on extra high end because you knew the cassettes would sort of dampen the high end and they put it into the CD which heightened the high end and so you got a very harsh experience and it, it took a few years for people to realize they had to really do a mix separately for CDs and master separately for CDs. It was largely in the mastering process that you could fix this. Um, so anyway, to go back to Little Creatures, so we recorded that, and then when we were mixing it, we actually recorded all of the basic tracks to True Stories because their songs were all written, and we were sort of on our game of playing because we had just been recording all of Little Creatures. And so E.T. would be mixing... Uh, little creatures in the control room and we'd be rehearsing and working up a song. And then when we were ready to record one, he'd, we'd interrupt the mix 
or let him finish the mix if it was almost done, finished and we'd listen to it and decide it was a finished mix and then record the song. It's actually a very efficient use of the studio. How did you get involved in doing more outside of production, like the, uh, the Violent Femmes? Well, after, so as I said, Nona Hendrix was the first thing I produced, and then when I did my own solo record, it was obvious to me that I really liked working with other bands and that I had, was starting to have the comfort level of being a producer and making decisions about other people's music. And and also, you know, I had uh, been involved with David Catherine Wheel and make, making suggestions. Let's use, use this drummer. Let's change studios. Let's you know, it's kind of things that you end up doing automatically as a producer. And so, the Violent Femmes came along because I had had to start spending a, a great deal of my time back where I grew up in Milwaukee. My father died suddenly and my mother had cancer so I rented an apartment in Milwaukee and split my time between New York and Milwaukee and I kind of was going what am I going to do when I'm here so I started making casual gods at, and I followed this recording studio that actually was the younger brother of someone who had gone to nursery school elementary school and high school with me who actually had committed suicide just after high school but an amazingly brilliant and talented uh, painter uh, and his brother younger brother who I guess was probably a baby when I was over at his house had built a recording studio and he was very tight. his name's David Bartanian and I ended up making a, a lot of records with him and I found that it, even after my mother had passed away that I enjoyed working in Milwaukee because the price of the studio at, was so much less than what I could work for in New York. And I ended up often working with bands that I felt like needed to not be in a rush, such a rush as recording as their recording budget required. And I think that people, I think that uh, Bob... Oh, his last name's escaping me from their, from their record company. I think that everyone kind of understood that of having worked with Jonathan and David, that I'd be a good fit for the Violent Femmes and, and Gordon's particular sensibilities. Um, the unfortunate thing is that they, they were having a lot of strife as a band as we did that, that album and ended up actually short-circuiting their tour and ending it and kind of breaking up and just as the album sales were starting to move. So it never quite saw as much um, success as I think it, it kind of deserved. And I also then went on living to, in Milwaukee to producing the Bodines. There's a band called Semi-Twang that released a record on Warner Brothers. It's fairly unknown, but they were really a good band, and I produced them there. I, I did. I produced a single that came out in England for its immaterial called "Driving Away from Home." There, um, my name is not on that record because I was angry with how much they changed the mix, and I, in a fit of peak, said, "Well, then take my name off of it," which was, of course, idiotic because it went to the top ten. <laughs> but I did produce it, and. Um, I felt sort of, it was a must have been a very weird experience for, it was these two guys, and they'd done all of these different records. And in fact, I was flown over to England and, and Holger Zuki, uh, they wanted us to work with Holger Zuki as well. Uh, and it was a, a, a very interesting idea and combination, although Holger and I became friends, but he didn't work on the, on this record. But we did that single. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but you should look it up. Yeah, we'll do. Could you talk a bit more about how Casual Gods got made then? So anyway, that, so, same, same so same. Casual Gods got started with Alex Weir and I working at this studio in Milwaukee when we had time off. After the tour for Stop Making Sense, not after, before the tour for Stop Making Sense and after the tour uh, for, for Speaking in Tongues. And 
so we were just again once again doing it music first and doing these kind of jam things between us but you know we're just composing in the studio and but they kept getting you know that that process and i also was trying to improve myself as a singer so the album actually took a number of years to record partially because i kept getting interrupted by making a talking heads record and going on tour and you know doing producing somebody and you know a number of other things that just uh I produced an album for the artist Elliot Murphy that we started in New York and then moved out to Milwaukee. And that was just right after we finished recording Little Creatures. And uh, he's an interesting, you probably don't know who he is, but he, Bruce Springsteen and he were considered sort of vying for the young version of Bruce Springsteen at one moment. Obviously, Bruce Springsteen <laughs> uh, had the success and Elliot, through changing of record companies and various things, fell further away. And he eventually ended up moving to France. And he now lives in Paris with his his French wife. And is very does tours largely through Latin Europe. So he has of quite a following in France, Italy, and Spain, where because they like his poetry. He's a very um, very wordy songwriter and he had been a fan of the modern lovers and in fact i had worked on the night lights album with him with ernie brooks after the modern lovers broke up before i met the talking heads and we recorded at electric lady in uh in new york so elliot came you know had remained a friend and i used to sit in with him down at tramps when he would play sometimes and I started producing this record, and, I, and then I moved it to Milwaukee once again because I thought I could get we could get a better recording, and also it was uh, less expensive. But it inter- you know again this kept interrupting this process of making casual guys. How did Steve Lillywhite get involved with the Talking Heads for Naked? I think that after not having a producer on True Stories, Little Creatures, and Speaking in Tongues. We decided that we should have um, someone, an outside person, and we decided someone would be that. Um, partially because there was a certain, you know, the there was an enough tension between the members of the band by that point that we thought that having an outside person would help because. When you're producing yourself, another member of the band becomes the person who critiques your performance, and you know, has, you know, says, "Could you just do another take, or could you, you know, things that producers are in the position that could very much annoy and piss off the musician." Like that one was great. Why am I doing this again? And we didn't want to add that to add that level of potential frustration, and and we had decided. Uh, David had some songs written, but I think there was a general feeling from Chris and Tina and me that we didn't want to be repeating the process that we had done from True Stories and Little Creatures. We wanted to to have it be a little bit more akin to Remain in Light and Speaking in Tongues, which I think actually quite annoyed David. But I think... I mean, I think it was a good idea for variety in our record. And again, as I said, we've always... We always try to have sort of a unique... Um, the studio environment to help, help inform what the, the album was. And so we, I mean, we brought in Wally Batteru, who certainly, from a musical point of view, had a lot of musical suggestions, even just in what he played as someone to join us in the studio. And he knew all of these, uh, basically mainly West African musicians who joined us at various points. And... I was friends with fellow Ransom Cootie's management at the time, and they knew they. So we got a couple of other people <laughs> coming in, including you know the fantastic choral player Maury Conte. And but there's an amusing story is that someone brought some kind of message from this guy who had been whose fellow's manager. And he shows up, he's this African 
gentleman and we go, are you the guitar player? And he goes, yes. And so he plays this completely like a, a, a guitar part that really has nothing to do with the song. And we go like, okay, well, you, could you, you know, could you try and like be in tune with more with the <laughs> chord changes? We spent like an hour recording him. And then we kind of finally figured out that he actually wasn't the guitar player who was coming. He was just like a messenger dropping something off. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that was quite an adventure. And, and, and Steve suggested having Johnny Marr come and play on the record. And you know Johnny was it. We had a lot of guitar players. It was it was a, another style to to join David and mine, and and then all of the and then African guitar players who came and joined us. So there were a lot of different influences at that point. And I don't know exactly how. I think we just had met Steve Lily White over the years, and he was sort of a friend, and so we. Uh, it just sort of made sense to to ask him. Finally, can you talk a bit about uh, Walk on Water, your third solo album, and how that came to be? Which one? Walk on Water. Walk on Water, yes. So that was, of course, um, Casual Gods was by far commercially the most successful solo record I made. Rev it up. Was a was a quite successful single in Australia, New Zealand, and successful in the United States. So that was the follow up record. And by this point, I had met my wife, and we were. Uh, I again found a different studio that had been built in Milwaukee, where I just got this sort of unbelievable brand new studio that I got this unbelievable view, and so. We once again did this sort of composition in the studio process, um, and various other people from people I knew in New York would then come out to Milwaukee and join us, but also sometimes local musicians there. And uh, Ernie Brooks was much more involved in that record from the Modern Lovers as a co-writer of the lyrics and the. Um, he had gotten involved with Casual Gods near the end of it. Um, and Ernie, I had known, you know, was, was really my best friend, I'd say. He had been my roommate in college and had uh, studied poetry. And was we have kind of came across a songwriting technique for lyrics where he would come up with lyrics and I would then sort of pick from a like a and change from pages of lyrics that he wrote that was about a subject. And, you know, there was a, a sense of, you know, having rhyme in it, things like that. And that's how the lyrics got developed in that album. Uh, I think that you could really tell the 80s sound on that record. That that song was um, David Bates, from who had signed me to Phonogram, was very involved in helping to pick a mixer on that record, Bob Crouchauer, who had done a bunch of it. But, but the sound of the kind of exploding um, uh, snare drum that Bob Clearmountain had sort of pioneered working at Little Mountain Studio, recording the echo in the, in the, uh, like where the, the, where trucks delivered in the, the, uh, I don't know if it was, it's, what is it? It's like the delivery bay of Little, Little Mountain Studios that he found that there was yeah. this sort of gated echo sound that, I mean, if you listen to Live Aid, there's a sample of that on every single, on every band that's played because Bob Clearmount mixed it. So that that was very in vogue. And if there's any, that's, that's probably the thing that kind of bugs me the most now about uh, Walk on Water is the, there's a date, there's a, you can tell the date almost of when it was mixed. But I think the songwriting and my singing, when I listened back to it, my singing had gotten, you know, improved better. I was like the tone of my voice. And um, I think there's a lot of really interesting songs on that record. I think I Cry for Iran is uh, just, a you know, is like an in, sort of amazingly complicated but very, very successful arrangement. 
and songs like Cowboys Gotta Go, which was about ja- this about Jackson Pollock. I had read this book about the life of Jackson Pollock. And so the lyrics of that are sort of inspired by that book. And so, the, you know, there's a lot of explorations in different directions. Um, unfortunately, I never, I never toured with my own band behind that. I did a tour with Chris and Tina where we were combining Tom Tom Club's songs and my solo work called the Escape from New York Tour, which was the Ramones... Uh, I think it was Deb Collar, Debbie Harry calling herself Debbie Harry, not Blondie, although Chris Stein was with her. And um, and then Chris and Tina and me, and we went across the country. There was uh, there was David Bates wanted to delay the release of the album after we had confirmed the tour, and he was he in many ways then made because he was angry that I didn't delay it as he had asked. But it was sort of impossible between the coordination between Warner Brothers and him uh, and Phonogram. So I, it, it, it certainly um, affected the... Uh, I mean, it, it, I'd had a top five record in New Zealand, and I don't think this record anybody ever knew it came out in New Zealand. I went down and did a week of playing in, in a club down there where studio musicians had learned my songs. And they were completely unaware of Walk on Water. And so it was, a, it was an example of sabotage by the record company. <laughs> what are some of the albums that you've produced since then that kind of stand out to you that you're most proud of? Well, I like them all. I mean, there's the obvious ones like Throwing Copper that you go back and you just go, you understand that to a degree it's sort of this perfect record. Um it was live at hitting a a sort of a comfortableness in their playing from having toured after mental jewelry and the writing and Ed singing. And it just, you know, it was just, it, you know, it was a, it, it, I mean, it was sort of, it, it, it really was a groundbreaking record also and just the sonic landscape that was so consistent through it that, a, that a influenced a lot of records. Um, I think the crash test dummies, I think particularly the single Um 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 was a completely unique song and very, you know, became very successful. And, you know, Brad really, really hit it on that song, his unique perspective. I mean, it's a very intellectual perspective. I think he'd been an English teacher in Winnipeg. I don't think that they ever went, and I don't think they ever used a producer again after that. And I think it's unfortunate because I think that um, I think there were times where they thought that maybe I wasn't doing as much, but there was a lot of work that had to be done on trying to make their drummer sound good. And eventually, there weren't other people to do editing of it at that time. There was the beginning of Pro Tools being part of the process, and. They, but also, we tried things like on some of the songs having string arrangements and various things, and ended up saying, "No, it sounds better stripped down." You know, but that was a decision to make to not do it. <laughs> it was a very important decision. So I'm really proud of that. I'm really, um, I love the song "New" that I did with uh, No Doubt. I really like "Walking After You" that I did with. The Foo Fighters. I love the um, Von Bondi's record. I think it's an incredible record. I think that um, the record I just last made with the Butcherettes called By Mental is, uh, I think they're just an unbelievable group, but I think Terry's a really amazing writer and performer. Uh, I think the Rusted Root record I did, I think the Violent Thumbs record, the Bodine's record, the... Um, there are, I think the general public record came out really, really well. It was a, a it was a challenging record to make. David Dave Wakeling's father died in the process of it, and delayed making the finishing the record, and the process became kind of fractured. But in the end, I think it's a really good record. I think. Um, well, those are a few. I mean, you know, if I kind of went through the, I, I know that I've left out some wonderful records. Um, you know, there's actually a bunch that when I when I started the company Garage, 
GarageBand.com, which was the invention of crowdsourcing. Eventually, that name was licensed by Apple for their program. But GarageBand.com was a attempt to have people comment on music before you spent the money on 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 where what you were going to whether or not you would invest in the record. It's sort of in a certain way we were a little early because we still had to to uh, rely upon physical delivery of records. And had it been at the time where the internet had gotten fast enough for digital delivery, it probably would have worked. It, be, it eventually became I like, and uh, was sold to MySpace. But there were there were a couple of of albums I did for that that never came out. There's a number of records I did. So there was a, a album called Mono Vox and one called Rebel Amish Radio. That are really wonderful records. I did a record called Trailer Park Pam for Interscope that that uh, didn't come out. That's a, a great record. It's very frustrating as a producer and as an artist to work so long on a record and. Uh, then you know the music business was going through its its reaction to streaming. I mean, to the to digital downloads and then eventually streaming and contracting. I did a, a band called the Bamboo Shoots, and they wanted to remix parts of it. And Virgin Rec Virgin Airlines was actually using the singer. Uh, this was an interesting band. They were four people whose heritage was from India and one from Egypt. And they had won a contest that MTV on MTV that would got, gave them a record company on Epic. And so a friend of mine put the lead singer of Veer in this ad campaign for opening up Virgin America's route from San Francisco and LA to Seattle. And we had finished mixing the record and I went, you're not going to get any, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to get the record out now. But they were very, they were, you know, really, they're all, you know, college educated and came from very uh, uh, intellectual families. And so they had their own ideas about how, the perfection they wanted on their record. And they ended up, we ended up remixing it and in some ways improving it. But by the time the delays happened, the people who had signed them to the record company were gone. And it only came out on iTunes. And the same thing happened to a band called Mr. North I did, is that because of their hesitation, they uh, they delayed when the release schedule would be, thinking that they can improve the record, but they ended up only destroying their career. <laughs> so that was... That was um, Frustrating. So the record, you know, the 90s were a golden period because the, the records came out, people still were buying CDs. And so, you know, the budgets were reasonable enough that you could actually make a record in the re enough, you know, and have time. You could hire the mixer that you wanted. So I think the records that I'm most known for, with perhaps the exception of the Von Bondies and a couple of others, came from that period of time.